Um, all right, last time I was explaining time reversal in classical mechanics. Uh, we took a trajectory in, in, of a particle in three dimensional space and uh, reverse time on it. That's the, can be considered the trajectory you get if you ran the movie backwards. And we find that if the, uh, the question we ask is whether the time reverse trajectory also satisfies Newton's laws, the answer is it depends on the nature of the forces. If a force, for example, is an electric force on a charged particle, uh, then the time reverse motion does satisfy Newton's laws and is a physically allowed motion. Whereas that's because the acceleration on the left hand side involves only second derivatives, and so the two minus signs are changing the sign of time cancel out. Whereas if the forces are due to magnetic fields, because there's a D cross B force, the force is a velocity dependent force. Uh, when we change the sign on time, it changes the velocity, and so the right hand side changes the sign, but the left hand side of the acceleration doesn't. So it's a basic rule then that if motion in an electric field is, um, is time reversal invariant, whereas motion in a magnetic field is not. Now, in making these statements, uh, it depends on what you call, the, what, how you define the system. Here we're thinking of the electric and magnetic fields as just being given external fields in which the particle is moving. There was a similar issue you'll recall in regard to parity. However, if we include the charges and the currents which produce the electric and magnetic fields in the definition of the system, then there's a different situation. Uh, as you know, uh, charge densities basically give rise to electric fields, whereas charge currents uh, give rise to magnetic fields. Charge currents involve the velocities of the particles. So in a time reversal, it's, uh, it's fairly clear that the charge density goes into itself. You're not changing the motion of the particles, whereas the charge current is the sign. These are the properties of densities and currents under time reversal. And the result of this is, is that electric fields go into themselves under time reversal, whereas magnetic fields change sign. And these are part of the transformation laws which are involved in understanding at a deeper level than I'm uh, giving you here, understanding the transformations of the electromagnetic field in the time reversal. In any case, if we apply these transformation laws to the fields on the right-hand side, in other words, if we include the charge and currents as a definition of our system, then we see the equations are mapped into themselves in the time reversal, and time reversal invariance is restored. So there's two, uh, there's two lessons here. This is that uh, time reversal invariance depends on the definition of the system, but another one is, is that the, the electromagnetic forces are actually invariant under time reversal if you include the electric, electromagnetic fields themselves. All right, so this is classical mechanics. Now, what about quantum mechanics? Uh, let's suppose we've got a, 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 I'll do the same kind of game. Let's suppose we have a solution to the equations of motion. Uh, which, uh, and let's say, to be specific, that it's a stemless particle moving in three dimensions. So we've got some time-dependent uh, wave function like this. And we'll suppose that it's a solution of the Schrodinger equation, time dependent Schrodinger equation, a part d dt psi, is equal to a Hamiltonian times psi. Uh, what Hamiltonian will we choose? Well, let's repeat kind of what we did here, but at a quantum level. First, let's take an electric field. If we did, uh, then the Schrodinger equation, of course, is minus h bar squared over 2 and l squared, and then plus q times the scalar potential, phi of r multiply it on the side like this. So this is the Schrodinger equation for a particle in an electrostatic field. Now, uh, again, to repeat, let's suppose that psi of r and t is a solution of this equation. The question that we first want to ask is, what if we just change the direction of time? Is psi of r comma minus t, is that also a solution? I'm just repeating the same type of the questions we asked earlier at the classical level. And the answer in this case is no, unlike the classical case, because Schrodinger equation is first order in time, not second order. And if we just change the sign of time, then the left-hand side changes sign, but the right-hand side does not. And so if this is our definition of the time reverse state in quantum mechanics, then it is not, it, it is not a solution of the original Schrodinger equation. However, we can fix this up and, and obtain a genuine solution if we replace psi of r comma minus t by its complex conjugate. <coughs> this is a new wave function obtained from the old one. And the new wave function does satisfy the original Schrodinger equation because in changing the sign of time, there's one minus sign introduced from the left-hand side. But I'm taking the complex conjugate of the Schrodinger equation. There's a second one because of the i here. And so time reversal invariance is, uh, is restored, or as we say, time reversal invariance holds 
for the uh, emotion of the charged particle in an electrostatic field, just like in the classical case. However, it's necessary to make this the definition of the time reverse solution. Similarly, if we have a magnetic field, yeah, let's take let's take this as the definition of the time reverse solution. But let's suppose there's a magnetic field now, then the Schrodinger equation involves the usual thing, it's the momentum is minus I H bar gradient minus Q over C times the vector potential squared applied to psi, like this. <clears throat> and you can now see that even with this definition of the time reverse state, it does not satisfy the original Schrodinger equation, assuming the first the first wave function does satisfy it. The reason is, is that I'm taking a complex conjugation. Uh, the minus i gradient will turn into a plus of itself, but the q over c a doesn't. So these two terms suffer a, a, an opposite sign for the change of psi, and so the uh, Hamiltonian operator does not go over into itself. And so it's just like in the classical case. We have time reversal invariance for electrostatic, motion electrostatic fields, but not in the case of magnetic fields. <coughs> Now, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a time reversal operator. Sorry to come this up. A time reversal operator in a quantum mechanical system, which we call theta. Uh, this operator does not involve time itself. It's, it's rather, it's, a, uh, it's a, an operator that maps uh, cats into cats or state vectors into themselves. So I'll write it like this. It's, that's what it means as a mapping. And uh, what we will do is interpret, uh, interpret the following. That if we take the, uh, the state as a function of time, let's say this is a solution of Schrodinger equation, uh, we replace t by minus t, and then we, reply, then we apply this time reversal operator. We will regard this as the time reverse solution, which I'll call psi r of t. In wave function language, psi r of t is just the complex conjugate of the original wave function with t replaced by minus t. Um, uh, but in general language, our, our time reversal operator will satisfy this equation. Now in fact, in the special case of, of a, a spinless particle in 3D, if I write this out in wave function language, it's just what I had in the previous form, is that psi of r of t is going to go over into a psi of r comma minus t complex conjugate which we will just define to be the time reverse state of psi of r and t. So this is what theta does in that particular example. And actually, from this particular example, spinless particle in 3D, you can see already that the time reversal operator cannot be a, cannot be a linear operator. Because a linear operator can never take a wave function into its complex conjugate. It will always take wave functions in, into themselves, or into new wave functions, but never with a complex conjugate. So in fact, it's an anti-linear operator, and I'll say more about that in a minute. <coughs> now, <coughs> uh, for general systems, we're going to uh, derive the form of the time reversal operator, very much like what we did with parity, uh, by writing out a, a list of uh, postulates and demands that, that it should satisfy in general terms. So the postulates are this. Is that first of all, that theta dagger times theta should be equal to 1. This is just like we did in parity, and it, uh, the logic is we want the uh, symmetry operation to preserve probabilities. The second requirement is, well, the second and third requirements actually come from what we do in classical mechanics. Uh, allow me to go back a moment to this definition of the time reverse state right here. <coughs> if we evaluate this equation, uh, let's take this one here in Ket language. If we take this Ket equation and evaluate it at t equals zero, it becomes very simply just this is that theta acting on the, uh, the original state of time as zero is equal to the time reverse state of time zero. In other words, the theta operator, the time reversal operator, maps the initial conditions of the original state into the initial conditions of the time reverse state. Now in classical mechanics, if you're doing initial conditions, uh, let's say it's consists of the initial position of momentum, so let's talk classical mechanics here. If you time reverse the initial position, uh, the initial conditions, it doesn't do anything to the position, but it, since it changes the velocity, it will change the momentum also. And so this should go over into R0 and minus, minus P0. That's the effect of time reversal under time reversal. This is classical time reversal on <coughs> initial conditions. But given that our theta in quantum mechanics is supposed to map initial conditions of the original state into the time reverse state, what we expect is, is that we expect certain conjugation relations on position of the minimum operators following the classical pattern. <coughs> so we expect 
expect that if you conjugate the position vector in time reversal, it ought to just go into itself. But if you conjugate the momentum operator with time reversal, it should go into minus itself, corresponding to the change in, 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 uh, in the velocity. <coughs> now, so these are our basic postulates that our time reversal operator should satisfy. It follows from number three and four that if you take r cross b, which is the orbital angular momentum, and you conjugate that by time reversal, then it should also go over to minus itself because r doesn't change sign, but p does, so there's an overall minus sign. I'll remind you that angular momentum is even in parity if it's odd under time reversal. And this statement, which holds here for orbital angular momentum, we will generalize and assume that uh, it actually holds for all types of angular momentum, so that theta j theta dagger, where j is the angular momentum of any system under consideration, uh, should go over to minus itself. It's a logical extension of what holds for orbital angular momentum. So these are requirements of, of, a, <coughs> of, the, uh, of the time reversal operator. Now, given these requirements, it follows, one can show rather easily that the time reversal operator cannot be a linear operator. We can just work in one dimension. Let's take x and p and take the commutation relations, which is xp minus px. And this is, of course, equal to i h bar. <coughs> and now, allow me to take, uh, uh, let me allow me to take theta and multiply it on this side, and theta dagger and multiply it on the other side. Uh, if equation one were true, theta would be an ordinary unitary operator. So for the sake of argument, let's suppose theta is just an ordinary unitary operator with these conjugation relations at numbers two and three. Well, then it's going to leave the, the x's, x variables alone, but it will change the sign of p. So on the left-hand side of this equation, we get minus the commutator, minus x, p, minus p, x. Change the sign of that. But the right-hand side is just a C number, and so if theta is unitary, it just goes right through the C number, and you get the IH bar again on the other side. Obviously, these two statements are in conflict with one another. The left-hand side changed sign, and the right-hand side didn't. Oh, this should be a theta dagger, by the way, on this side. Um, however, if the time reversal operator is antilinear, then it will change the sign of the I here when we pull it through it. I'll say something more about the properties of any linear operators in a moment. But it induces a complex conjugation here. So for an anti-linear operator, we get a minus sign there. And the result is, is that the canonical commutation relations are preserved. And so we conclude then that from these, these requirements on, the, on this operator that it, uh, that it must be a, an anti-linear operator. In fact, an anti-unitary operator. <coughs> All right. Now, so far, in talking about symmetries, I've always said that uh, we require the symmetry operators to be unitary in order to preserve probabilities. But now we're talking suddenly about anti-unitary operators, anti-linear operators. And so I want to tell you something about uh, a theorem which is proved by Wigner in back in the old days, the 1930s or so. Uh, <clears throat> it concerned the question about, <clears throat> the general question about symmetries in quantum mechanics. Wigner posed the question in the following way. He said, suppose we have a, a, an operator, uh, suppose we have a, a mapping that takes the cat space into itself. We think of it in order to match state vectors into state vectors. And, and this is going to be some kind of a time reversal op excuse me, this is going to be some kind of a symmetry operator. Uh, I'll, I, don't, I won't give it a name, but it could be any symmetry operator. And we will impose the requirement that the measured probabilities are the same for all possible measurements that can be made, both before and after the symmetry is applied. So if we have, let's say, two initial states, psi and phi, and we apply the symmetry, the symmetry here, and let's, let's call the new state psi prime and phi prime, then what Wigner uh, requires is that, the, uh, is that the scalar product psi prime and phi prime, absolute value squared, or even absolute values of us, should be equal to the absolute value of the original scalar product. And this has to be true for all uh, psi and phi. Now, the reason that this is a vigorous requirement is, is that what you actually measure experimentally are not amplitudes. They're not scalar products like this. Instead, one measures probabilities. 
And it's necessary to carry out further analysis to extract what the amplitudes are, underlying amplitudes are. You will recall what we did in the case of the Stern-Gerlach apparatus with, with all the amplitudes we got from probabilities. And so uh, what, what Klingon requires is that probabilities be conserved. If you allow me to square this, these become probabilities uh, under the symmetry operation. <coughs> And then by a more a careful analysis, certainly, than we've ever carried out in, in, in these lectures, Wigner is able to show that such a symmetry operation must either be a, a linear operator, excuse me, in fact, not just linear, it should be a unitary operator, or else an anti-unitary operator. And those are the requirements. So those are the only the types of operations that uh, can satisfy this. There's actually phase factors involved in the, in the argument, which I'll gloss over, but this is the basic conclusion of it. You can read about this theorem in uh, Messiah's book on uh, Messi, as they say, the book on quantum mechanics is a reference for it, or else in uh, Stephen Weinberg's book, uh, Volume 1 of Field Theory, that also has a discussion of this theorem. In any case, um, for our purposes, what it means is this, is that uh, some symmetries are implemented by unitary operators and some by anti-unitary anti operators. Now, in fact, the only uh, yeah, just a second. In fact, the only anti-linear uh, symmetry that we will encounter in this course is time reversal, and that's what we're talking about now. All the others, rotations, parity, and, and the others that we'll see too, are, are actually implemented by means of unitary operators. Yes, what was the question here? So, um, so could you remind me what uh, exactly is the definition of an anti-unitary? Yeah, I'll get to that in just a minute because we haven't really talked about them much yet in the course. All right. In fact, that's my next. Uh, that's my next. Uh, uh, that's my next uh, 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 topic, which is to talk about uh, what anti-linear operators are. So, before I talk about anti-unitary operators, let me let me address the question of anti-linear operators in general. If I denote a linear operator by L, uh, this is a mapping of the Hilbert space onto itself, and an anti-linear map. In other words, it maps cats, cats into cats. And an anti-linear operator is also a mapping from cats into cats. The difference between them, let me, let me denote linear operators by L and anti-linear operators by A for the purpose of this lecture. The difference between them is, is how they behave on linear combinations of vectors. If I take a linear combination, C1 psi 1 plus C2 psi 2, where C1 and C2 are complex numbers, and I apply a linear operator to it, and then you get the usual rule is that it distributes this way. It's C1 times L actual on psi 1 plus C2 times L actual on psi 2. So when the linear combination goes over like that. If we do this for an antilinear operator, acting with the same linear combination, what it turns into is C1 complex conjugated times A acting on psi 1 plus C2 complex conjugated times A acting on psi 2. In other words, the anti-linear operator causes the complex conjugation of the expansion coefficients when you have uh, linear combinations of vectors. Now, one of the ways of summarizing this is to say that an anti-linear operator does not commute with a, uh, a, 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 a an ordinary number, an ordinary C number, uh, which, uh, when it is being viewed as a multiplicative operator in its own right, if you take the cat and multiply it by a complex number, that's a simple type of an op linear operator. But an anti-linear operator does not commute with that. In fact, if C is a complex number, what we have is that A times C is equal to C complex conjugate times A. And I'll put a box around this because this is one, that is the first one, of the rules which apply to anti-linear operators, which are not the same as the case of linear operators. There's actually three rules, and so I'll now move on to the second one. <coughs> Here's the second rule. It has to do with uh, the action of operators on cats. Uh, let's review the situation for linear operators first. Suppose a linear operator is given, so we know what it does to cats. That's to say if psi is a state vector, then Li, acting on psi is known. We know what that does. Now, way back in the, in the first week, uh, I gave a lecture on this. The question was, given that, L, given that we know what L does to, to cat vectors, the question is, what does it do to bra vectors? Let's suppose that phi is a bra, and we want L to act on it. The notation is we put the L to the, L to the right of the bra, and we can't get rid of acting on it to the left. Now, the idea is we want a definition of this thing. 
Now the idea is is that uh, the idea is is that since phi is a bra, L acts on it, and uh, it's going to produce another bra. The whole thing that I've written here is actually a bra. Well, what is a bra? A bra is a mapping from linear, linear mapping from the Keck space onto the complex numbers. This is a it has to be linear, and this is a definition of your X bra. So the uh, the phi L uh, here is supposed to be a bra, and therefore it's a linear map on Ketz, and therefore I can take it and allow it to act on some Ketz psi. And the question is, I'm trying to define what this thing is in the parentheses, and I'm going to define it by saying what it does to Ketz. Well, here's what it does to Ketz. It gives this as the bra phi times L acting on psi, where I put parentheses like this to show that on the right hand side, the L acts on the right to the side. It's given where I'm, it's given that the action of L on, on Ketz, so this part is known, and therefore this makes the definition of the action of that bra on an arbitrary Ketz side. Okay, that's the logic of it. However, what, so it's like the L is acting to the left here and to the right there. However, once this, uh, once this definition has, has been written down, you see that the direction in which L acts doesn't make any difference. The answer is the same independent of it. And so it's customary to drop the parentheses and just write it this way. And we can say that in the matrix element, L can act either to the right or to the left, and it won't make any difference in the answer. Now, let's try the same thing for bras, excuse me, for antilinear operators and see if it works. Let's suppose that the action of an antilinear operator on cats is known. And let's suppose we wish to define the action of that antilinear operator on the bra. Let's try the same thing we did here with linear operators. Let's try this and say that since the since A acting on the bra psi is supposed to be another bra, let's specify what it does to an arbitrary ket. And let's just say that this is psi with A acting on phi like this going in the other direction. And the question is, does this give us the definition of A acting on psi? We do know what A does to phi. That was understood that, that uh, well, A acting on phi. This is known for all. Uh, for all states. So the action of A on cats is known. So the right hand side becomes known, and this certainly gives us a number. And thus, this bra which we're trying to define certainly is a mapping from cats on the numbers, just like I said here, that's what a bra is supposed to be. However, the question is, is it a linear map? And the answer is no, it's not, unfortunately, because uh, because um, uh, because A acting on a acting on psi, uh, let's see, let's see how do I want to say this, is that, uh, yes, so, yes, so what we're trying to find is A acting on psi. Uh, and the question is, is whether this, this thing, which we want to be a bra, whether that's a linear map acting on phi. Well, um, if I replace phi by linear combinations, you see, when I let A act on it to the right, I get complex conjugates of those coefficients. And the result is, is that this is actually, this is a, this is a, indeed, a, 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 something that acts on, on cats and produces complex numbers, but it's an antilinear operator and not a linear one. And so this doesn't work as a definition of A acting on laws. However, we can fix it up if we complex conjugate the right hand side, because then the map does become linear, and then this thing here becomes a, becomes a, uh, becomes a genuine bra. And so this is the second property uh, in which the antilinear operators differ from linear ones. It looks like this. I'll write this out as an A uh, acting to the left on psi with parentheses to indicate the direction of action times phi is equal to psi with A acting to the right on phi and then brackets around this parentheses to indicate the direction of action parentheses around this in complex conjugates. This is the second rule, which differs from that of ordinary linear operators. I don't really need the arrows here because the parentheses tell me which way it's going. I'm just trying to emphasize so the arrows tell me that this has to act on that. And the parentheses indicate that in certain degrees. I can take the arrows out, uh, but uh, and you can put them back in if you want to remember which way the A's are acting. So this is a complicated looking formula and it's hard to remember because of all the parentheses and brackets and stuff. But it's much easier to remember if you put it in words. Here's what you say. As you say, in the case of a linear operator, it doesn't matter in a, in a matrix element whether the linear operator acts to the right or to the left, and so we don't need to specify which direction it goes. 
In the case of an anti-linear operator, however, it does matter. If the egg acts to the left, or if the A acts to the right, what happens is if you change the direction in which A acts, you have to complex conjugate the matrix element. And that's the easiest way of remembering this. Change the direction in which the A acts when you complex conjugate the matrix element. All right. Now then, there's a third property uh, that we need to discuss, and uh, which is uh, which is uh, can be regarded as one of the differences between uh, linear operators and anti-linear operators. This has to do with the definition of the Hermitian conjugate. Again, let's review the case of linear operators. In the linear operators, we have a linear map of the Kett space onto itself, so that L acting on the state psi is known for all states psi. The uh, question is, how do we define the Hermitian conjugate, L dagger? L dagger is also a mapping, supposed to be a linear mapping of the Kett space onto itself, and so therefore we need to define what L dagger psi is equal to. Given that we know what L, is, L acting in size, what is L dagger acting in size? Well, the answer to this is, is that L dagger acting on psi is equal to, what we do is we take bra psi, let L act on that from the right, which we know how to do, because that's what we just discussed over here, and then take the dagger of that. And by counting, counting things, you can see psi, psi mapping it into its bra as an anti-linear operation, but then taking the dagger again makes it overall linear. And so L dagger is a linear operator. It's actually distinct from the original one. Now, you can put this in a more familiar form if I take both sides of this equation and I multiply by some arbitrary bra like this to take a scalar product. So the right-hand side, so let's multiply on the left like this. So to write it out, on the left-hand side, we apply a scalar product with L dagger psi, putting it in parentheses for emphasis. And this is equal to phi scalar product with a state I'll call, uh, uh, maybe it's best if I call this alpha, like this, where alpha is, is equal to psi L uh, quantity dagger. Now, phi alpha is the same thing as alpha phi complex conjugated. And so this becomes the same thing since alpha is equal to this, is, is equal to this dagger, I right? undo the dagger, and what I get is psi L, in this case acting this way, multiplying on the phi with an overall complex conjugate. Well, for linear operators, it doesn't matter which way it acts, so I can drop the parentheses. And the net rule of this is that phi L dagger psi is equal to psi L phi complex conjugate. It becomes this result. This is, again, just a review of linear operators. This is oftentimes taken actually as a definition of L dagger. This has to hold for all states phi and phi psi. It's also a special case of the rule that if you take a permission conjugate in this in expression, you just write it backwards, daggering a complex conjugating everything, and you get the right, the right answer. All right, now, let's ask how this same argument works in the case of, of, uh, of, of uh, antilinear operators. <coughs> The basic, basic result is, is, that, is that it does work, it works just the same, but because anti-linear operators, it makes a difference which way they act, you have to be careful about that. So here's the situation again. Just run through this same argument now, except for anti-linear operators. Again, we have an anti-linear operator, which is a mapping, mapping that takes our cat space into itself, and we wish to define A dagger, what's it equal to? Well, we do it like this, just as we did before. A acting on psi is known. And so we define A dagger acting on psi. This is known. And, we, and we wish to define A dagger acting on psi. And we write this as psi bra with A acting from the right. And this whole thing is dagger. Previously, in item number two, we defined what's, what happens when A acts on bra. So the right hand side is defined. Now again, if I multiply both sides of this with a drop phi like this, and uh, let's let let's let uh, uh, let's let alpha let's let let's let uh, alpha be let's see let's see how do I do this? And yeah, let's let alpha be uh, equal to uh, can alpha be equal to 
A dagger, A dagger psi. And letting phi out to the left hand side, this becomes phi scalar product of alpha. But that's the same thing as alpha scalar product of phi complex concentrated. But alpha converted into a bra is the same thing as psi A acting like this, multiplying onto phi, and the whole thing is complex conjugated. Okay? On the other hand, the left hand side can be written this way as phi with uh, a dagger acting on the side like this, parentheses showing that it acts this way. Alright, so let me go back to this. So that's the main result. Let me go back to the other board and put it below the, the other two items because this is the third rule uh, where you have to be careful with, with any linear operators. It works like this. It says, uh, let's see how to write it out best. The left, the right, the left hand side this way is that phi, scalar product, a dagger, acting on the side with parentheses to show that the a axis is right. <coughs> is equal to psi a, parentheses showing the ax to the left, times phi, and then the whole thing is complex conjugate. All right. This third rule is also messy to write down, and it's also hard to remember for the same reason. The fact is, is that the Rax Brockett notation is not so good for any linear operators. And uh, in fact, I, I would be tempted to, to, to use a better notation, except I don't want to add any more notation for you. But uh, if you say this in words, it's not too hard to remember. Uh, you recall when I'm taking a dagger of an expression in quantum mechanics, you reverse the order of everything, and you dagger everything in sight uh, as you write them down. Uh, the dagger of a complex number is understood to be the same as the, uh, as the ordinary complex conjugate. Well, the rule number three is basically that the same rule still applies even in the case of any linear operators, except you also have to reverse the parentheses. So here, let's take the right-hand side here. This star here is the same thing as daggering this expression. It's just a, just a number. But in order to find out, what, in order to apply this rule, we write it backwards. First, phi ket becomes a phi bra, which you see here. Then there's a parentheses, which is reversed, and the a is gets reversed and daggered, and then the psi abroad turns into a psi cat, and there's the final parentheses. So you see, if you're just applying the usual rules, except you're, you're, uh, you're, um, you're also including the parentheses in the process of doing it. So those are the three rules by which anti-linear operators uh, differ from linear operators. Time reversal is the only anti-linear operator that we'll ever use in this course. It's the main one that people use. Uh, so you don't have to use these rules all that much, but, uh, but they, uh, you, you have to use them for time reversal. All right. Now, uh, so this is, a, this is then is the story of anti-linear operators. Now I want to say something about anti-unitary operators. An anti-unitary operator is an obvious definition to say A is anti-unitary if A dagger times A is equal to 1. Let's notice a simple rule here, which is that if you take the uh, product of two anti-linear operators, you get a linear one. So if A, and a, if a is anti-linear, so is A dagger, the product of them is linear. So it makes sense to equate this to 1, which is a linear operator. Uh, I can show you that uh, that's the definition. That's all there is to it, really. Uh, but let me, uh, uh, in reference to Wigner's theorem, let me show you that anti-linear, or excuse me, anti-unitary operators preserve probabilities in the sense of uh, Wigner's statement. So let's say uh, we have two states psi, and I'll write it up this way, two states psi and phi. And let's define prime states which are obtained by applying an anti-unitary operator to them like this. So these are the new states under the operation. Now let's consider the scalar product psi prime with phi prime, and let's try to express it in terms of the original scalar product of psi with phi. Uh, using psi, the definition of psi prime and phi prime, we take the bra of the first, or a permission conjugate of the first equation, and it becomes bra psi times a dagger, and I put parentheses to show now that it acts to the left. And then for the phi prime, I just copy it, and it's a times phi, and I'll put the parentheses in to show that it acts to the right. It's a scalar product of those two things. Here the A dagger acts to the left and the A acts to the right. 
Now what I'm going to do is reverse the direction in which a dagger acts and use rule number two, which says I have to conjugate, I have to complex conjugate to make it solvent. So this becomes psi, and then a dagger a acting on phi, where now both a and a dagger act to the right, so it looks like this, except I need to put a star on the whole thing. By, by rule number two. On the other hand, if a is is anti-unitary, then the a dagger a product becomes just one, and so this whole thing turns into psi phi complex conjugate. But what you see then is, is that under an anti-unitary operator, scalar products go over their complex conjugates. They're not invariant, but they're squared and invariant, and those are the measurable probabilities. And so this is the uh, this is the criterion which is which is the biggest theorem. All right. There's a little more about antilinear operators. If I have an anti particular antilinear operator, it's oftentimes convenient to write it in what I'll call the LK decomposition, LK decomposition, in which K is an antilinear operator. Uh, and of course, A is also, we're assuming A is given antilinear operator. And uh, L is a linear operator. And the idea is, is that you choose K to be a particularly simple antilinear operator, one that's easy to work with. The idea is that K takes care of the antilinearity, and then the linear operator L takes care of everything else. Now, the type of uh, simple, so we want to look at the question of what are some simple antilinear operators. Uh, here's the uh, usual uh, type that is, uh, that is considered. Let's let uh, capital Q stand for just the shorthand for some complete set of commuting observables. Now, uh, the, uh, in practice, this could be a, a whole list of observables, and some of them could have a continuous spectrum and some could have a discrete. That would be the case in position of S sub Z that we've been talking about, for example. However, for simplicity, let me just imagine there's just one variable and it's got a discrete index. So in the eigenstates of this complete set of commuting observables is n. We get the idea from just a simple example. So these are the eigenstates of the operators in this complete set. Now, uh, I'd like to now define an operator which I'll call k, k sub q. It's one of these k-type operators that's associated with this complete set. And it's defined in this way is that it acts on one of these basis states and just maps it into itself. That's why it's a simple operator. Now this equation, if you don't think about it too hard, uh, looks like it implies that kq is equal to 1. Because you're acting on, on a, these are, uh, these are, this, and the ends are form a basis, so you're mapping all the basis vectors into themselves. However, kq equals 1 is not only not true, in fact it's not even meaningful. The reason is that k is an antilinear operator and 1 is a linear one. And it doesn't make any sense to say 1 is equal to the other. So in fact that statement is not true. On the other hand, if I square k, k squared q, well, kq squared, apply this to the <coughs> kq squared is the square of an antilinear operator which is linear, and you can easily see that that is equal to 1. So kq here is a kind of a square root of the identity operator, but it happens to be an anti-unitary operator. Now, uh, let's suppose we have an arbitrary state, and we expanded this linear combination with coefficient cn, these basis states, in like this. Then if we apply our kq to the state psi is equal to a sum on n, and because of property number one up there, remember when you apply an linear operator linear combinations, you have to complex conjugate the coefficients. So this turns into cn star times n. What we see is, is this kq operator, which I'm advertising as being a simple n-linear operator, has the effect of complex conjugating the expansion coefficients and the corresponding basis is used for this complete set. By the way, this depends also not on just the, just the observables of the complete set, but also on the phase conventions for the eigenstates. Because if you change them, you can change the phases that go into these expansion coefficients. Well, in any case, this is a simple rule. This operator just, uh, just uh, complex conjugates expansion coefficients. The expansion coefficients, I'll remind you, are what we call the wave function. So, in other words, what kq does is that it complex conjugates the wave function in the q representation. And in particular, if we're dealing with a, 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 a spinless particle in three-dimensional space where the wave function is psi of r, and the complete set of commuting observables of the three components of the position operator, 
then the operator of the alcohol case of R, what does it do? Well, in axon position, eigenstates will just maps them into themselves. What does it do to a wave function, psi of R, under KQ, or KR in this case, I'm replacing capital Q by R there. What does it do? It maps it into its complex conjugate. We saw earlier that the complex conjugate was needed in doing time reversal on a uh, spinless particle moving in an electrostatic field, so we're getting close to time reversal here. So this K operator in the position representation just means complex conjugating position space wave function. It's a very simple uh, rule. However, if I've chosen a different, uh, a different uh, complete set, such as momentum, uh, and talk about the operator case of P, you would find that it's a different operator. It has a different effect on, on state vectors than does KR. So these K operators are dependent on the representation of each being used. It's a fairly easy to show, if I may go back to the general notation, it's fairly easy to show that this KQ operator is actually anti not only anti-linear, so it's obviously anti-linear by this property. If we're assuming it's anti-linear, this, this property that manifests here. But it's actually easy to show that it's anti-unitary. Let me do that here. Take this down because we're continuing now with this, K, this general KQ notation. It works like this. Suppose we take KQ dagger and apply it to N, and we wish to work out what this is equal to. To show that it's anti-unitary, we need to show that KQ times KQ dagger is is one, or the KQ dagger is the inverse of KQ. That's going to be the goal. So let's work this out. I'll show you how you can use these three rules up here to work this out. The first thing I'll do is insert a resolution of the identity to the left. So we sum on M, and we've got M, M outer product like this. And then we've got K, KQ dagger applied to N. But since KQ is anti-unitary, anti or it was anti-linear, we need to be careful which direction it acts. So let me put parentheses here to show that it acts to the right of the N. Now then, um, let me write out first the outer product again like this, or the, the sum on M anyway, the first part of the outer product. The rest of this is now a, a matrix element. And I will now use rule number three, which says that I can reverse the whole thing if I put a, if I reverse the parentheses and put a dagger or everything and put a star on it. So this becomes a bra N on the left, KQ now without a dagger, Parentheses around all of that, and then cat M on the right. Okay. Now, uh, 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 something tells me I'm. Something tells me I'm not doing this right. Uh, yeah. So somehow I want to get this into a. Oh yes, okay, so yes, now here's what, yes, okay, I remember now. So here's what we do next is, we, this KQ is now acting to the left, you see. Next we use rule number two, which says that if you change the direction in which KQ acts, you have to complex conjugate the matrix element. So this becomes a sum on N, just copying the first part of this. And then we have N on the left, KQ in the middle, and M on the right, except now KQ is going to act to the right as indicated by the parentheses, and I better put a big star around the whole thing. Now, KQ on M acting on the right, since the definition of KQ is, is it just leaves the basis vectors alone. So this means I just drop the KQ. Then I have the, then I have the matrix element NM, which is a chronic or delta. That's real, so the star doesn't do anything to it. The sum it just turns into a single sum, which is in itself. And the result is, is that KQ dagger acts on N and maps it into N. It does the same thing as KQ itself did. And thus, they're the same operators. <coughs> so the conclusion is, is that the KQ, KQ defined by this, this equation satisfies the property of KQ dagger is equal to KQ. It's also clear that if I square it, I get 1. KQ dagger squared is equal to 1. That's a, a linear operator, of course, because you apply just KQ to this a second time. And so this means that KQ dagger is also equal to KQ inverse, and the result is that KQ is, is not only anti-linear, it's actually uh, anti-unitary. So these K operators <coughs> that we apply for always, uh, are always anti-unitary uh, anti operators. 
And in fact, for a long time, it was believed that all realistic Hamiltonians commuted the time reversal. This is, turns out is not exactly true. It's, it's a similar situation with parity, you'll recall. And uh, I'll go into that next time and, and tell you more about specific Hamiltonians, when they do and don't commute the time reversal, what the physical implications of that are, uh, and, uh, and, and various aspects of that. So that's all. Uh, so before you go, uh, let me remind you, I'll send, I'll send out an email as soon as I get back to my office, but next Tuesday, next week is Thanksgiving week, right? So we're going to have three lectures next Tuesday, regular one on Monday and Wednesday, and then an extra one on Tuesday night. And nobody's complained about 6 p.m., so I'm going to have 6, 6 to 7 p.m. Is that all right for everybody here on next Tuesday night? All right, so then uh, I'll go ahead and schedule it for that time and uh, send out an email this morning to confirm that. Thank you.